Vladek is now fighting on the front lines. How frightening, especially since he's only had a few days of official training. How can he survive as a soldier? Isn't he just a textile salesman? Fortunately for Vladek, this isn't his first time in the army. When Vladek was a young man, his father did all he could to keep him out of the army. You see, in Poland at the time, when a man turned 21, he had to do compulsory army service. Vladek's father thought that being in the army was a fate worse than death. He even pulled out 14 of his own teeth to avoid it. There was only one way to avoid being conscripted, and that was to fail the army medical exam. Three months before his exam, Vladek's father put his plan into action. It was brutal. Vladek could only sleep three hours per night, eat salted herring and drink coffee. He wasn't even allowed to drink water. By the end of it, Vladek was a caffeinated skeleton. No wonder he failed the exam, but the doctor told him to come back next year to be reviewed again. Vladek couldn't endure that crash diet all over again, so in 1922, he joined the army. Hey team, just a reminder, if you like this video, please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. It really helps the channel out, and our next upload could be on something taught in your next class. Thanks, and back to the video. But this didn't mean Vladek was a fighting machine. Far from it. He didn't even know what to shoot at, let alone how to dig a trench properly. When Vladek began shooting, all he could see was a tree. But then he noticed that the tree was moving. Vladek kept shooting at it until the tree stopped moving. Lo and behold, a German soldier had been using it as cover. After two hours of fighting, the Germans overwhelmed the Polish forces. Oh no, what would happen to Vladek? He and the other Polish soldiers were marched at gunpoint to the German side of the river. They were now prisoners of war, and their job was to retrieve the dead and injured German soldiers. After that, they were all taken to a place near Nuremberg. It was a nightmare. The place was crowded, and the Jewish soldiers were separated from everyone else. Of course, the Jewish prisoners had it far tougher than anyone else in the camp. The German officers set work with impossible deadlines just so they could punish them. A few weeks later, Vladek was transferred to a bigger camp. To cope with the hardships of being a prisoner of war, Vladek had to distract himself. He survived for six weeks in these camps until a call was put out for volunteers to replace German workers who'd been called to the front. Meals and proper housing would be provided. This was an offer Vladek couldn't refuse. Soon enough, he and his comrades were staying in wooden houses with real beds, a far cry from the camp tents. What they didn't know was that the work was brutal. They literally had to move mountains. One night, Vladek was so exhausted that he had a strange dream. His dead grandfather was speaking to him. He said that Vladek would be free on the day of Pasha's Truma. The voice was so real that Vladek couldn't ignore it. Pasha's Truma was a day on which they would read a certain section of the Torah, the Jewish holy text. But that was three months away, an eternity in the camps. Vladek waited and waited, and to everyone's amazement, his dream came true. The next morning, Vladek and his comrades were loaded onto a train headed for Poland. Finally, he would be reunited with Anya and Richu, or so he thought. Why was the train steaming past Sosnowitz? You see, the Nazis had divided Poland into two zones, Protectorate and Reich. This train would only stop in the Protectorate. Sosnowitz was in the Reich. Vladek ended up far away from Sosnowitz, in a city called Lublin. What a nasty trick. 
This wasn't the first time the Nazis had redirected prisoners of war to Lublin. Two days prior, the last group were taken into the woods and shot. 600 people were killed. Was Vladek next? Luckily, the German officials in Lublin were corrupt. Local Jewish leaders bribed the Germans into classifying prisoners like Vladek as relatives of local Jews. Even better, Vladek had a friend from his army training days in Lublin named Orbach. He pretended that Vladek was his cousin. Vladek was safe. But after a few days at Orbach's, Vladek became restless. He had to get back to his family. But how could he cross the border? Fortunately, the guard at the train station was Polish and despised the Nazis. Without too much trouble, he smuggled Vladek onto the train. Thanks to that Polish train guard, Vladek made it home. First stop was to see his parents. But when he arrived, he got a nasty shock. The Nazis had shaved off his father's beard as a form of public humiliation. But that wasn't the only bad news. His mother's cancer was getting worse. As much as he would have liked to, Vladek couldn't stay long. He had to be quick if he wanted to see Anya and Richu. At 7pm there was a curfew and all Jews had to be at home with the lights out. Fortunately, it was only a short journey and Vladek, Anya and Richu were soon in each other's arms. At last. From Vladek's first impressions, it looked as if nothing had changed at Anya's family home. Though, no matter how rich the Zilberbergs were, no one escaped the hardship of the war. There were now 12 members of their family staying with Vladek's in-laws. Imagine all the crowded dinners. On top of this, there was a shortage of food, and the Nazis gave Jews next to nothing. Officially, they could only get food with coupons. However, Mr. Zilberberg was an important man and influential with the Gemeinde, the Jewish community organisation, so they got a little extra. But it still wasn't enough to live on. The Jews had to find other ways to survive, so a black market emerged. There, money could buy you anything, but the risk was enormous. To add to these problems, the Zilberbergs were short of money. Their factories had been stolen and they were now living off their savings. But they remained optimistic, believing that the war would be over soon. Vladek was not so naive. He knew he had to make money to survive. So, Vladek went back to what he knew best, textiles. He went to one of his old customers, Mr Ilzeki, a tailor, to get some materials. He was now trading textiles without coupons. This was dangerous. Then things took a turn for the worse. The Zilberbergs, desperate for income, tried to sell their furniture. The Nazis caught wind of this and simply took their furniture without paying. It was daylight robbery. In late 1941, Vladek was still trading textiles. One day, he went to see Mr. Ilzeki as usual, but he almost didn't make it. Vladek stumbled into the middle of a Nazi rampage. They were beating and shooting Jews, whether they had papers or not. There was nowhere to hide. Thankfully, Mr. Ilzeki spotted him and whisked him to the safety of his house. Whilst hiding, Vladek and Mr. Ilzeki began chatting. They both had little boys the same age. So, Mr. Ilzeki suggested that Vladek give Richu to one of his friends to protect him. When Vladek brought this up at home, it caused a huge fuss. Anya and her parents were dead against it, so Vladek relented. It was a decision he would later regret. Ilzeki's son survived the war. Richu did not. At the end of 1941, all Jews in Sosnovitz were rounded up and relocated to another part of the city. All 12 of them now had to cram into two and a half small rooms. The kicker was that non-Jews got to move into their house. It was so unfair. 
Eventually, after a couple of months, Vladek's business came to a halt. The Nazis had arrested the shop owners he traded with for dealing goods without coupons. Not only that, but the Nazis hanged them and left their bodies on public display for a full week. For days, Vladek was too frightened to go outside. He couldn't bear to look at them, knowing he was partly responsible. It still makes Vladek cry to think about it. Little did he know that this was only the beginning of such horrors. In 1942, another announcement came. All Jews over the age of 70 were to be transferred to Theresienstadt. This was in Czechoslovakia. In the propaganda photos, the place looked like a community for retirees, but everyone had their suspicions. What would happen to Anya's grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Carmio? They were over 90 years old. They had to hide them, but the Jewish police were getting suspicious. That's right, there was a Jewish police force that helped the Nazis. These Jews thought they could save themselves and others by working with the Nazis. But in reality, the Nazis had started sending Jews to die in Auschwitz, a death camp in southern Poland. Anya's grandparents were no exception. A few months passed, then the Gemeinde made another announcement. All Jews had to register at the local stadium to get their documents checked. Everyone was worried, but they figured that not going was as bad as going. On the day, Dienst Stadium was packed with almost 30,000 Jews. The officials divided the crowd down the middle. On the left were old people, families with lots of kids, and people without work cards. On the right were those who could work and their families. Only the people on the right got their papers stamped. Fortunately, the Spiegelmans were sent to the right. Those moved to the left were destined for Auschwitz, never to be seen again. By the end of the day, Sosnowitz was a ghost town. Only one third of the city's Jews remained. The Spiegelmans were safe for now. But what would the Nazis have in store for them down the track? Stay tuned for chapters 5 and 6 to find out. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.